You're listening to the Casual Swinger Podcast. As your host, we need to warn you that the material you're about to hear may be sexual or explicit in nature. This podcast is intended for an adult audience. Now, we don't expect you to act like adults. What's the fun in that? We're a married couple living in Florida with over 13 years of experience in the lifestyle, and we take almost nothing seriously. Casual Swinger is a variety show, meaning we'll cover everything from music to events, travel, and even the occasional hilarious screw-up. Our show is about entertainment. We're not licensed professionals. Not anything. And our stories, commentary, and guidance should not be confused with the opinions of a licensed professional. Now that you know, let's take those pants off and get comfy. Oh my God. Welcome back. Finally, before the end of fucking time, welcome back to another episode of Casual Swinger. My name is Mickey. Hey, you. I'm Mallory. Nice Wait, I, we, I feel like we have to reintroduce <laughs> ourselves to everybody nice again. Be like, by okay. the way, this is a podcast you guys have never heard before because it's literally been over a month. Actually, we're a month and a half late. Yeah, we just looked back in Whiskey Business was the last episode. That was back in what, middle of January? End of January, January twenty fourth. Oh shit. So but still So anyway, hi, what, I'm Mallory. The proper fuck? Mallory Gordon. I'm a Virgo. I like long walks on the beach and whiskey. And a tongue in your butt. Yes. yes. Occasionally. Yes, I do enjoy when um somebody tongue punches my fart box. Uh huh. There's a throwback and yeah. a little shout out Holler. to Ray from Euphoria Chronicles. Who threatened to tongue punch your fart box at a event one I'll time? I'll never forget it as long as I live. I'll get eyes all listen to me. Alzheimer's. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, um, no, that's like when you first met him too. Yes, it, it did catch me off guard, but memorable. I feel like least. that's a way to make an impression on a woman. Just offer to tongue punch your fart box. Sure, it works a hundred percent of the time. Great She'll advice. Never forget you. Yeah. Like, hey, by that time, I meant that sexual predator. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so this episode is called WTF is in what the February and the imposter syndrome. But let's talk about what the February. Yeah. So, should, I mean, we're we're all about transparency and authenticity. So I, I think we need to be brutally honest here. Right. Like what the fuck happened to February? Where did we go? Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I feel like I still sound a little raspy. A little bit. So, you know, a few things were going on for us. Um, You know, just putting it out there. We'll start with, we had a little case of writer's block, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I and guess we, in, in a way, I guess I feel like some of that falls on me because I, you brought me so many good ideas for us to talk about when we sit down and kind of do our powwow sessions, and I just, was sh- I shit on everything. I was, I felt crappy, and I was just like, ah, you have so many good ideas, and I, I just could not wrap my head around any of them. Yeah, and you know what, I think everyone... The human side of us, we all go through moments like that in our lives where we're in a slump. And there's different influences that impact and give us that kind of result. And it's actually better that we kind of, you know, sequestered, circled the wagons, whatever you want to call it, and not aired that out. Yeah. and Does that make sense? To be perfectly honest, I did have this episode that I had my heart set on doing. And the person that I wanted to bring on the show very, very politely and kindly uh, declined and it broke my heart because I really wanted to do it. Yeah, but you still got a response. I did. So that's all. I that was mattered. very, very honored that he responded. What we're talking about is Alan Isaacman, who is he was the uh, he was Larry Flint's lawyer. Yeah, Larry Flint's lawyer who argued the case Falwell versus Larry Flint in the Supreme Court in 1988. I wanted to talk about the First Amendment with him, and, and he say, did get back to us, which I really appreciated. But yeah, all I remembered about him until you gave me a little more backstory was that he uh, was Larry Flint's lawyer, and the basis of that case was freedom of speech yeah. regarding Penthouse. Exactly. It was Hustler. Hustler. Yeah. I'm sorry, Hustler. Yeah. Yeah, well, and it, I mean, the whole thing was, it was a parody case, actually. It had less to do with adult entertainment than it did the right to mock a public official when it's obviously a joke. Yeah. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about is, you know, some of the things that are going on out there in the world today and, and us voluntarily giving up free speech despite, you know, un, under the terms of, you know, the cancel culture. And yeah, I was like going to say censors- censorship and cancel culture are definitely is something we're seeing a lot more of. Well, yeah, they don't have to censor than, us. We're doing it to ourselves. Yeah, it's it's very strange. Anyway, yeah. anyway I, I, that, I really broke my heart. I wanted to do that. We're getting I off know, topic. I but. know. And then, you know, the other part was you got really fucking sick. Like, oh, my God. Really sick. Yeah, super sick. Like, like almost like we had been at Hedo sick. Sometimes, I mean, I get really sick sometimes. <laughs> what a double whammy that was. Like, I, you inherently, and and I don't mean to air your shit out there, but like when you get um, respiratory illness, 
you're down. Yeah. And well, then I certainly can't do a fucking talk show. You're you're pretty much a, a, a cat's hair away from uh, pneumonia. <laughs> you always any... freak out when I get sick, though. It well, because you're you're my my kid, my one that's gonna go under a fucking tree and just die and not tell anybody. Probably. Yeah. I'm like, so... I'm fine. Rub some dirt on it. Yeah, now, but you couldn't even talk. You could barely speak. No, like, I couldn't breathe. And it was, it was just bronchitis, by the way, guys. It wasn't COVID at this time. This is the thing that yeah, I know. You, ah, you foreshadowing. Put it yeah, right. <laughs> In literature, they call this foreshadowing. But no, uh, it, it was not COVID. I checked. We took like three COVID tests. It yeah. was just straight up bronchitis. But the bitch of it was the doctors wouldn't give me antibiotics. So in their defense, you know, it especially for a viral infection, and I'll use air quotes there, you know, you don't want to over-prescribe antibiotics because when that happens, you become resistant to them at some point, right? We've we've created a culture where we were given antibiotics for total bullshit reasons. Well, yeah, now, but I don't want to be sick for two goddamn weeks before they finally give me an right, antibiotic. Right, but we, in, it's a great example of a culture that we live in because do, we do a lot of telemedicine, mm-hmm. that the value of in-person um, engagements with your doctor because I think that was a differentiator for you. Yeah, and it took like two weeks for you to actually get the care and the therapies needed to get you through. Yeah, and I don't think they could actually see how shitty I felt over telemedicine. Like, I felt royally shitty. Well, and I finally had saying. to call a doctor who's a friend of ours. He's actually yeah. been on the show before and be like, help me for Christ's sakes, this sucks. So I got the antibiotic. Three days later, I feel right as rain, which is just in time for the corn feds and a bunch of other friends that we, we had, had coming a, in. We had house full swingers and it was like... The best thing ever. And it happened right in the middle of this fuckery on the show. Now, yeah, so you had just started feeling better. Like, we were like, ah, across the finish line, confetti and fanfare. Yay. Yay. And enjoying all this wonderful time with our friends, which it was absolutely incredible. My soul felt well fed. It after really that, did. After um, that weekend. I felt like we were us again for, like, because we had not been us for a month. Right? I've been I sick liter- so long. I literally looked at myself in the mirror and went, hey, me, it's good to see you again. Yeah. And obviously having Derek and Jess here is just, well, I mean, I, I don't know how else to put it except they're family. I mean, they are, amazing. they really are. And they're the people, if you're around them and you're not in a good mood, that's on you. Yeah. You obviously have a fucking problem if, yeah. if you're not happy with them around. And, and of course we had a bunch of other folks here. We had our friends from South Carolina. We had some more friends from Iowa yeah. here. We had and some th- friends from down the street. I think you owe school couple of money, by the way, for that reference. Oh shit. Yeah, <laughs> I do. School couple called that shit. Damn it. Anyway, all right. Well, I anyway, digress. Sorry. so uh, thanks for bringing that up. All right, all right. I guess I'm <laughs> sending him a beer. But anyway, uh, the the gist of it is, one of them, one of these couples, one of the couples from Iowa that is not Derek and Jess, uh, came here directly from Hedo, on which the was Rascals amazing, trip. by the way. They yeah. went on the Rascals trip and then came it totally adjusted their plans to come see us. Right. By the way, they did not have a flight out of here when they got here. <laughs> Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, they we would have no kept way them. to get back to Iowa. Oh, we would have kept them forever. That's fine. They are amazing, and they're super cool, and we we actually really, really, really enjoy their company. Yeah, and our friends from South Carolina. Yes, our friends yeah. from South Carolina are absolute hoot. Which they're in the water sports business, and the only reason I bring that up is because our neighbors that know that we're swingers saw their truck that said water sports on it and come over <laughs> and are like, so is there some new shit you guys are into you need to tell us about? I didn't even think of that. Oh, yeah. That's great. That happened. <laughs> of course, that's the mouth of the South in the neighborhood. So she probably told everybody we were getting pissed on here. Oh, no, it doesn't say golden showers. It just said water sports. Well, I think that's the same thing. Though, she right? probably doesn't know. Uh, I don't know. She's kind of a freak. She likes ball gags and shit. Remember? That's. I don't know that that says she's a freak. Oh, okay. Maybe she's just into ball gags and shit. Anyway. Anyway, so yeah, they they came in for a weekend here at the compound, and we had a really good time, except the folks that came from the Rascal trip happened to bring COVID back from Jamaica. Gee, why don't you just call them out? Well, they did, and you know, we've done it. We (laughs) went on that trip, and we got COVID. It is a little fucked up that we... We avoided going to, you know, obviously mitigate our risks there, and then we don't go and we get it. fucking COVID anyway. Now, granted... Thankfully, knock on wood, it was a mild case for me. Um, yeah, it was speak annoying. for yourself. It was annoyance. You definitely got hit like a with a ton of fucking bricks. Well, like, I was just coming off of having bronchitis literally right. days before. <laughs> right, and your immune system was depressed, and you're a mess. Literally, it's been um, almost two weeks yeah. now. Yeah, so. it's, and, and, you're, and I'm still testing positive. Yeah, and I mean, you're, you're, but at least you have a semblance of normalcy to where, like, I don't know, you can breathe. Oh, yeah. Which is great. Yeah, I'm going to start working out again tomorrow. But I, I really do think that it's crazy how much different your immune system is than mine because I was 
literally just laying there feeling like I was going to die for days and days and days on end. And you were down for like a day and a half. And then you're bing, right back up and um, upstairs yeah. working out again. Yeah, it was like three, four days. I swear to God, you're a cyborg. Maybe I am. I don't know. You're, you're fuckbot3000. That's what we're going to call <laughs> you from now on. You know, I will say that my immune system got a lot better when I quit smoking, which by the way, it's going to be a year. Fuck yeah. Congratulations to me. Just get a big Woot. round of applause for our friend Mallory. No? No? No. Most- Okay. Did your button not work? No, I missed the button. Of all the times Should for you not to hit the applause. button, I was actually encouraging that. Okay, here it goes. Thank you. Thank you. I love you too. Round of applause for Mallory. <laughs> no, but, you know, I do think that it was amazing and it sucked. And that's really kind of what happened, guys. We just got sick and then got sick again. And, and of course, there was just a couple. It just confluence of events i hope you guys forgive us and hang out and enjoy the rest of the show yeah. because we got a lot to talk about if you know if you're still here thanks for uh hanging in there yeah right thanks for not abandoning ship <laughs> hey let's talk about pcap real quick yes PCAP let's is, get on to what, the 60 percent sold out yes and i oh my god i'm so excited i started shopping for my theme night outfits and i can't fucking wait some of it's a little left up to interpretation i think i'm gonna take a weird spin on it but i'm still fucking jazzed about you it. you know what we did pcap in miami and i did not go full don johnson but i'm doing it for this oh, one white a. linen suit baby i think you just oh i'm my i can feel my heart rate increasing because i'm so excited about it and I, this is no bullshit. It may be my favorite lifestyle event. It's not maybe. It is mine. It's it's so hard not to chalk it up to that because not only do we get to see some of you know our favorite humans that we've come to know, especially over social media over time, we always get to meet new people. The events are always on point. The extras are on point. Kate always keeps something under her hat as an element of surprise, like the burlesque dancer at the oh, gala yeah. night. Like, that was fucking amazing. And like half the people had never seen a burlesque show. Uh, like, count me among them. Yeah, I know. I was so shocked. I'm like, we've been together 16 years. We've never seen a burlesque show. Well, probably because um, I didn't know what the fuck it was, so I didn't go in. Yeah. So, anyways, I digress again. Um, I, I'm just totally pumped. So I hope um, if you're listening and you're thinking about summer plans, please consider joining us at Podcast Blues in Palm Springs. Yeah, it's in Palm Springs, California. That is the golf capital of the universe, if you guys aren't aware of it. <laughs> It'll this... be the swinger capital for a weekend. Yeah, right. <laughs> I can't tell you which hotel it is, but I'm telling you right now, it's the biggest hotel we've ever done PCAP at. There are a bunch of new folks that just got added, right? Folks like 4-Hour Play and Swinger University yes. who both just got added. If you haven't checked out their shows, make sure to go check them out. You know, 4-Hour Play is pretty interesting. They're a very young Swinger podcast. I think they're both barely 30 years old. Oh my gosh. So they're kind of, you know, talking to a different generation there, which I think might be kind of cool. Hey, and, hey, hey, I'm an elder millennial. Like, okay. they're not totally, I mean, well, maybe they're separate from my generation, but. Well, we'll probably get into it more next episode, but I got new glasses, so I'm feeling extra old. I look like a fucking English professor. Hey, that's them. fucking hot, by the way. For some people. For your wife. Okay, well, that's and helpful. all the hot chicks that want to bang you. That's a cute Like, come on. Oh, anyway, right. back to PCAP. Back so, to PCAP. like, um, all, all the shit that's going to go on, not only their, their theme nights, um, parties, um, like topless pool parties. Oh my God, yeah. Which and is something we had in Miami that was fantastic. Oh yeah, and we're kind of known for the crazy shit we do during pool parties. So. I don't know what you're talking about. I am demure and well behaved. And I just want to point out that Jay from Average Springers will be there and when we have a pool party and we are emceeing a pool party and Jay shows up, wacky shit happens. Oh my gosh, uh, Mankini. All I'm going to say is him and his Mankini. That's right, check him That's out. It. That, Mankini.com. That is com. worth the cost of entry, folks. <laughs> Well, hey, if you don't know about it, it's podcast-a-palooza.com, but I'm guessing you live under a rock if you haven't heard of that by now. Don't miss this. It is going to be absolutely fantastic, and we would appreciate you guys supporting it. We're going to run a little long in the intro today, guys, because we missed you so much. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll I'll hustle it up. Now you got to hustle shit. I just wanted you guys to know <laughs> that we're we're doing that on purpose a little bit today. But okay. let's talk about our new partnership because we do have a new partnership that is leading into something we're going to talk oh about next episode. This is so cool. And I was I'm not going to lie. I was a little skeptical about uh, the conversation when it started. Right. Um, but more to come to this. We've started down the road partnering with a whiskey brand right here in Florida. Um, Von Payne Whiskey. Yeah, that's right. These guys uh, reached out to us and I went down and met with them a few weeks ago. It was in the lull right between COVID and bronchitis. Mm -hmm. And I managed to go meet with the CEO and I was really impressed with really where they were headed with the brand. They're targeting the lifestyle for their brand. They're What I love is they're not just targeting, they're embracing the lifestyle, right? These 
I guess alternative alternative mar- lifestyles, yeah. Alternative uh, lifestyles and alternative markets, right? They're being very intentional with their marketing, and I actually fucking love that about them because they're like, this is not just for the mainstream. This is this is a whiskey that's very different than anything else that's out there on the market. So they're marketing to different quote unquote different people, and I, I fucking love that, and it's delicious. It, it actually really is, and, and I think the people that are going to love Von Payne whiskey are the people that don't already like whiskey. I think that it's a good entry into whiskey, mm-hmm. and I think it, as long as you are comfortable with the flavor profile, even if you do like whiskey, just knowing what it is, you should be good with it because it makes an outstanding old-fashioned with zero added sugar. That's Let's right. Let's start there. None. And it's it's very neat. The flavoring, can I can I give more detail about yeah, it? Yeah, go right ahead. I mean, at some point, if he drops the price on it, it might be whiskey of the month, but it won't be anytime soon. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's not totally out of range, but it's it's up there. It's it's above forty nine ninety nine. So. Yes, um, but it's it's a current whiskey. Yeah, black current. Black current whiskey, which sounds strange, but, you know, current is in that Raisin Date family. Right, mm-hmm. um, it's got a very unique flavor. It's sweet without being overpowering. It's not super sticky, so it is like a flavored whiskey. But it has a regular proof of ninety, mm-hmm. right? So it's up there, but it does not burn. It's very, very smooth. And it's made from a seven-year bourbon, actually. Yeah. So it's it's just absolutely outstanding. We're talking about this not because. And by the way, yet again, we have a partner of Casual Swinger that we don't take money from. We're, we're not exchanging money with these guys. We're talking about no. them because it's I, really fucking good. It is. I didn't want to fucking like it because I don't like flavored whiskey. Yeah. Let me tell you what happened, right? So we had all these people in our house, right? I think we had like 14 or 16 people here. Oh, yeah, I we had, had we invited bottles. locals. Yeah, that's true. I had six bottles. I have one bottle left. We went through five bottles of whiskey in a day and a half. That's how much people like Von Maybe Payne. we need a meeting. It wasn't <laughs> us. <laughs> It was our old friends like, freeloading off our bar. Yeah, it was definitely good. So <laughs> no, we're good we're really excited to to talk more. There's um a few things in the works, including the casual cocktail. That's exciting. Yeah. So keep in, keep your eyes open and your ears peeled <laughs> for the casual cocktail. I love it. Yeah, it's coming. You know what I'm super excited about? What's that? 30 days of lingerie. Uh, you better be excited because we got a lot of work to do. Oh my god, I've already started picking out my outfits and I can't fucking wait. Oh, this is going to be a fucking shit show. It's going to be. Are you kidding me? Oh, it's, how many photos I'm going to have to edit? Um, Edit? Are you kidding me? I have, Aren't I naturally beautiful? You are naturally beautiful, but what I mean. So sure. I tell people all this all the time. The only editing I do to Mallory's photos, is I put them on brand for us because I, we do have a very specific photo style that we well, do. And I think you're like, you don't want people posing as me too. No, so, so I watermark them, but I also take your tattoos out. Oh, that's true. Yeah, a yeah. lot of people don't know I have tattoos. Yeah, well, and I do that because they're personally identifying marks, and if somebody does steal one of your photos, I don't want it to be personally identifying for you. So oh, other than that, I don't edit your photos. Yeah, that's true. But I do feel my self-confidence in the month of April skyrockets because of this exercise. So thank you, Kate, at Wanderlust. Yeah, this is going to be really, really cool. So by the way, that is hashtag 30 Days of Lingerie on Twitter. If you're not looking for that starting April 1st, you should be because some of the sexiest women on this planet are going to be posting pictures of oh themselves. Gosh, it's like masturbatory. I can't wait. Yeah, it's I'm, be I'm that picture. pervert. And all of our ambassadors at CasualToys.com are going to be participating. So pay attention to what those ladies are doing. Mm-hmm. I'm very excited about that. I won't be able to help it. Mm-hmm. I love them. We got Allie and the Peppy Pineapple and Honey Spoon. Mm-hmm. 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 All kinds of good stuff going on there. All right. So what else we got? We got one last thing. This is actually what we're going to talk about today on the episode. Yes. So let's let's really get into the meat of this. I think we touched on it just a wee bit in the intro here. Just a wee little bit. Just a wee little bit. We're going to talk about the imposter syndrome. And this this may be very relatable from a, you know, human perspective. And it, when we put it into context here, you know, um, you ever feel like a bad swinger? I do. Yeah, we did. We yeah, do. All the time. Yeah. For the last, I don't know, month and a half when we've been living in a hole. Yeah. So we're going to dig into that today. Um, you know, we did have a great time with our friends, but, you know, how it left us feeling like... Maybe we were missing the ball on something. I mean, what what's your takeaway? I mean, I felt a little bit like an imposter. A I, little bit. I often feel that way. And, and again, we'll talk about that here in a few. But especially when we have everybody here and, and we're entertaining and we've got folks around. And, and we have every reason and every opportunity to play. But we don't. Or at and, least to ask. Yeah, we don't even ask. Or we're so play. busy doing what we do that 
maybe I wonder how many people ask themselves, am I doing it right because somebody else does it differently? Mm -hmm. And am I imposter because I don't? So we're going to talk about that here in a couple of minutes. But before we do, Mallory is going to, for the first time in uh, quite a while, Tell everybody how to find us. Oh, shit. I forgot who he is. Best of luck, Mallory. <laughs> and right. go. And we are Casual Swinger everywhere. You can find us at casualswinger.com. Feel free to shoot us a message or questions at podcast at casualswinger.com. Like us, would like to say something nice. Please feel free to say that on, um, you know, Apple Podcasts or Apple Music, wherever the, the fucking podcast lives. We have a fucking flag in your front yeah, yard, right. whatever you want to do. Yeah, but if it's negative, just um, keep that to your fucking self. Eat shit. <laughs> And uh, we're also on social media. That's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. And you can also find us on the dating sites. That's STC, SLS, Cassidy, and Double Date Nation. How could you literally forget that? You... I didn't forget it. I was pausing for dramatic effect. Oh, it was very dramatic. Yeah. No, I got to tell you, I there's no chance I would have been able to do that after not doing it for a month and a half like you just did. So. I actually sat here stressing over it for the last 15 minutes. So Is that why your palms are sweaty? Yes. Knees weak, palms are sweaty. Yeah, mom's my mom's spaghetti. I'm right here. Oh, that's gross. <laughs> that's disgusting. <laughs> Guys, we'll be back in just a hot second. You've been listening to Casual Swing. Two trailer park girls go around the outside. And we're back. Welcome back. Is that what I'm supposed to do? It's a, it's the second part, right? Yeah. yeah. I think I did the welcome back thing in the beginning, too, because I figured anybody that's coming back is literally coming back from a long fucking break. So. Hi, it's still Casual Swinger. Oh, yeah. And it's not been another month. No. Hi. It's only been literally like 30 seconds. <laughs> this I is the it. shortest break ever. Love it. Can we call it the next episode that would save us some time? Oh, I feel like now I need the Dr. Dre music to oh, go. Yeah, next episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. So let's let's get into um, imposter syndrome. Syndrome. I think we need to give the folks listening a little background on what it is exactly. So imposter syndrome is the idea that when you have a lapse in activity that maybe you're not like in the lifestyle anymore or that maybe you don't belong in groups or parties that you used to attend or whatever reason, you start asking yourself different questions, right? And I think that's kind of the context we're living in as far as the application of it right now. Yeah, I think certainly... If for us, yes, but I, I think it's also, you know, when you go somewhere to a party or to an event or to a club and everybody, for example, let's say, you know, 11 o'clock rolls around and the dance floor is half as full as it was an hour ago. And you go, where the hell did everybody go? Well, everybody went to the playroom. And you go, oh, well, that's not us. We don't want to go to the playroom. Does that mean you don't belong there? Are we good swingers? Are, are we Are we really, are we, Actually, can we call ourselves swingers well, how the if we don't do what everybody else is doing? I mean, how the fuck do you even define that, though? Like, what is a good swinger? Well, and that's just it. No one can define that for you, right? I mean, I mean, are, are we supposed to sit around asking ourselves questions? Like, how often are we supposed to play and still be able to call ourselves ethically non-monogamous, consensually non-monogamous, swingers, lifestyle, whatever you want to call it? I mean, there's so many goddamn labels out there. Do I get to call myself this stuff if if I don't do the style of play that everybody else is doing? I think those are valid questions, and it, I'm going to go ahead and, and just burst my own little bubble here oh. because I really feel that that comes from a place where I'm concerned about what my peers think and that they will f feel like I'm an outsider or an outcast, which goes back to fear, right? Sure. The false evidence appear appearing real. You know, we've talked about that before, yeah. but I'm hyper aware of that in environments where I'm an anom anomaly or the pack is moving in one direction and I'm either, you know, stationary or wanting to move in a different one. I'm very comfortable in the decisions I make, but there comes a point where you start to question that and go, OK, who who has visibility to this and how much are they noticing? Are they qualifying me in the process? Yeah, that's well, what I mean. That shit by starts in middle school. Hell yeah, it does. Right, there's the cool kids, right? It's the kids that got the money, the kids that dress nice, the kids that have you know maybe on the cheerleading squad or play sports, and they all hang it out happens together. Happens way before that, but it just becomes a little more prominent, more vocalized. I think. Right, and so let's say that you know these cool kids, you see these cool kids, and then you get in the club, mm -hmm. you start getting invited to parties, you start getting to hang out by the lockers, 
you get notes. You get in that note club, right? We start getting past oh, notes. Oh, that's so cute. People shit, don't right? do notes anymore. But yeah, I yes. know they text and Snapchat and shit, but you get yeah. what I'm getting at. Yes. Uh, or TikTok or whatever the fuck it is you guys do nowadays. You old whippers, snappers. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the trick here is once you're in a club, the scariest thing in the world is getting kicked out of it. Mm-hmm. Agreed. I think that's something that a lot of people worry about. And am I being noticed by my peers for things that I don't want to be noticed for? Mm-hmm. Like a lack of activity. Like getting invited to a playroom by beautiful people and declining. Yeah. When people look at you and go, you have no fucking reason to say no here. Everyone wants to be you right now. And you're declining. So... What happens? I mean, how do you, how, how do we, how do I, how do you, how, I mean, I don't know how anyone reconciles this without feeling like they're doing it wrong. Right. And we've actually had to answer for, for that specific um, example that you gave. Mm-hmm. Like people have questioned us they have. because of that. And I understand that they would do it differently. I'm almost offended that they feel so entitled to, to have that opinion so openly and publicly And maybe they don't realize the negative connotations that it had to it. But there's also their side of it, which is, why am I not good enough for you? Yeah, that's true. And I I would never want anyone to feel like they're not good enough. Like, that's awful. Like, uh, politely declining is very, very difficult. But you also don't want me to say yes just because it's very fucking obvious. No fucking poker face. No, you definitely don't have a poker face. But I think that it's worth mentioning here. That it doesn't matter which side of this you're on. If the answer is not yes, you're probably going to feel weird about it. It's pretty common. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. And I think uh, we're very incredibly fortunate to have had opportunities right there on the table at our fingertips. And uh, the polite decline comes into play. And it, it does make me wonder... Like, how rusty am I at this point? Does that make sense? Like, Who are what you if I telling? actually I say yes? Talked to a, I haven't talked to a microphone in, like, a month and a half. I feel as rusty as an old bicycle that's been left outside <laughs> since the 70s. But I, but I also met in, you know, a play situation like that. Oh, you know what I mean? i rusty there, too. I haven't right? been in a playroom in probably four years that I wasn't doing pictures or, like, journalism shit for. Yeah, I think, you, I think the last time we were in a playroom, yeah, no, you're right. It's probably, it was pre-COVID. Quarantine, yeah. yeah. Well, it's nothing against playrooms. It's just not usually what we do. Yeah. So I get, I'm a germaphobe. I get skeeved out by lots of people and the whole like group dynamic. The orgy thing is just not my scene. And I think I internalize a fear that I have about someone unwantingly like coming over. And that's not fair. Like we, we socialize. I remember. I remember. <sighs> We were at Hito in the playroom, and it was just you and I, and we wanted to bang under the stars, and mosquitoes bit us on the ass. It was hilarious. You got bit on the balls. I did. And you had, had an itchy taint. You had an itch, itchy taint for like three days. It was really bad. <laughs> it was not I was awesome. like, you can't do that here because people are going to think you got crabs. Well, the motherfucker, they could see if I had crabs at that point, and I don't have any pubic hair. I was hairs, gonna say so you didn't have any pubic hair, but that like one hair on my ass crack that I missed, I'd have like twelve <laughs> crabs hanging out on it, going, "What's up?" But I mean, I think. Going back to my statement of just having an inherent fear of being in a situation I don't want to be in, it's, again, probably not reasonable knowing the environments we put ourselves in. I just, I haven't mentally gotten over that hump. You just said a word that I think matters, which is reasonable. Mm -hmm. Fear is not reasonable. Of course it isn't. It's mental chatter. It's a monster in there, you know? Fear's not reasonable. And these... When we talk about the imposter syndrome, what we're really talking about is a fear that my activity, my actions, or my lack thereof will render me outside of the circles that I very much desire to be in. Yeah. I think one of the most hurtful things that happens to people in social situations is not love or hate necessarily because that takes a lot of passion and investment to feel those things it's indifference right mm-hmm. um i would hate to feel have people feel indifferent towards me especially people i care about well and i think part of what scares me about it and this is just me kind of open in my kimono a little bit not that i don't do that for you guys all the time but you know the truth is when we have these long lulls in our interactions with other couples and you know, I mean, this week, couple weekends ago is a good example. I feel further and further from the lifestyle. 
personally. Mm-hmm. And that's... I see that. I mean, COVID didn't help, right? That, I mean, definitely not. I, I felt further and further from life there for a while, but uh, my self-imposed ban on secrets has not helped, right? I yeah, mean, that's true from a culture perspective where we live. That's a that's not the hotbed, right? That is where yeah. the, the local swingers and the traveling swingers go to congregate, and it's just not something we want... We're participating in right yeah, now. So every time friends come to visit now, they're like, hey, we're going to Secrets. I'm like, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> so so it, that hasn't helped. No. Would it be fair to say that, you know, all of this kind of feels like everything you're doing might be making it worse? Yeah. Well, it's uh, kind of like kind of like quicksand, right? Which, I mean, I, as a child, I was led to believe that quicksand would be a much bigger problem than it's been for me as an adult. And anvils. Right? Yeah. Anvils from the sky. That was definitely a I've concern. I've never even seen an anvil, right. by the way. I have yet to come across quicksand and all my traipsing through the woods, but... No, it kind of feels like, I don't know, maybe the less we talk about something, the more we think about what the other person is thinking or feeling, and maybe it generates reactions inside yourself as if they're real, as if the other person's saying what you're afraid they're thinking. Okay, so the lack of dealing with it or pulling it out or or bringing it to the forefront and having conversations around it, you feel is attributing to the additional, I call it mental chatter, right? Those, Those nasty little negative voices in the back of your mind. And then it's assigning these emotions and feelings that may or may not be real in the first place. Yeah, like I'll be sitting in here and I'll go, well, we haven't talked to a couple in a while. We haven't been out in a while. We haven't gone and done anything in a while. Well, Mallory really doesn't want to anyway. Yeah, you're not allowed to talk for me. Whatever. That's Don't bullshit. tell my brain what to do. It does what it wants. <laughs> Your brain's a misogynist little fuck. <laughs> yeah, but it's dirty too. Yeah, that's I like that part. Yeah. Yeah. What, what about when we say things like, well, we're so busy, we don't have time to meet other couples. I think we've both been guilty of saying that. I think we have. And I think that's us having our head in our asses. You know, we, yes, our lives have this complication ebb and flow, which I'm sure does not make us any different than anyone out there in the universe. But we allow those complications to infiltrate the personal time in our lives to where we're not intentionally choosing to go do those activities. So it's easily excused by, oh, I'm just too tired or, oh, I'm so busy. And, oh, I have this checklist of things to do. And let's be fucking honest. I get hit by a bus tomorrow. Those fucking checklist items are still going to be there. So what is the actual harm in intentionally planning and carving out time to be those parts of ourselves when we can? I have a problem, I think, when it come, when we start to get into these lulls mm-hmm. that, that kind of almost really self-fulfills my imposter mm-hmm. syndrome. Mm-hmm. And we're going to talk about it more next episode because I think this is a much deeper subject than we have time for, especially given we had a nice long lead in today, but I'm not good enough. Mm. And I don't think I should reach out to these folks or try to inject ourselves into this situation. I think I see that. I can relate to that. I think it haunts you a little more than it does me. And I do. Feel you're hot as fuck. That does don't. I feel the same way when I look at you. So I don't think that's fair. However, in those situations, I can understand where that's coming from, but I have seen it become almost debilitating in the social um, applications, right? You allow it to speak for you and you make decisions for other people, which I'm going to go ahead and just actually say from their perspective, that actually might be rude. You're not allowed to speak for someone else. If they're going to have a negative reaction you have to be vulnerable and also solid enough to take those negative reactions, but at least allow them to have it. You know, there, there is a risk involved in these environments, and we're not going to be everybody's cup of tea. And I think we're actually more okay with that than we are at this point. I almost hate to say it, like trying. You've already made, we've already put up that blockade. You're saying, I'm not good enough, so I'm not going to move forward. So it makes you stagnant, stationary. Which just, I think, I usually end up sending the message. We've talked about this before. I usually send the message that I'm not interested. I know. It's easier than being told no. Which is. It's so strange. Yeah. Yeah, it's strange. And I find myself as your partner struggling to find ways to help encourage you, but also give you the space you need to work through that. You know, to be supportive and your cheerleader and build you up from a confidence perspective. But it also goes back to like happiness is really Mm -hmm. self-propelled. I was fear. Right. I can do, I can create the environment for you, but you have to choose that path. You have to want to be happy 
you create your happy. I can give you the tools. I can support you, but I can't necessarily make you feel it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Am I talking out of my ass? Well, no, you're not. I mean, I think it's, uh, I think some of these things we're talking about can become intensely and deeply personal very quickly. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, especially when we start talking about fear because it stacks up. Fear is this just self-fulfilling monster that when you focus on it, uh, I mean, I, it's one of the few times, and, and I don't have a man bun, so I really can't do this a lot, but when I quote Nietzsche, for example, and I say that when you stare into the darkness long enough, eventually it'll stare back at you. Mm. And, and this I, is what got you laid, by the way. <laughs> yep. And, 100%. This in the 80s stripped album. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah. Yeah, pulled some music out of my tail for that one. But I honestly think that when we really focus on asking ourselves questions where the only answer is driven by something you can't control, when I'm asking questions where the answer is something I have no control over and I try to create answers for the thing I have no control over, it's almost never going to be good unless you're this wildly positive narcissist that thinks that nothing bad can ever happen to you and that everybody loves you and everything. I mean, I only know one person like that and that's Sheila, (laughs) right? (laughs) But right, it's that everything is perfect. Everyone loves me. No one could possibly not like me and everything's going to be great forever. I just don't know people that think that way. So when you start asking these questions and focusing on these things, the reality is it can happen to anybody. The imposter syndrome can set in and make you feel like you don't belong. And I think it can happen to anybody, anywhere, anytime. And in my case, I, I've got a case going on because, you know, throughout this gap in our show, February was brutal for that shit. It was. And the the longer every week that went by that we didn't record, I could see it weighing heavily on you. Because, you know, we do this because we enjoy it. But I could see, like, you felt like you were letting people down. You were letting yourself down. You felt like you were letting me down or our listeners down. Um, and I love that about you and I'm sure our listeners will, will agree, you know, the, the show isn't tailored for an audience per se. Like we don't custom make this for demand and, um, notoriety. We do it because sharing some of these experiences hopefully might help somebody. Maybe not. Maybe it's just a little funny to hang out with us. Or maybe like everybody has different maybe they reasons openly, for listening to this. Maybe they openly mock us, and that makes their day. Like, who gives a fuck? I do some dumb but shit. <laughs> at the same time, we do this because we, in, in as a couple, enjoy it. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Um, but it, it weighed heavily on you, and I think the further out it got, the worse it got. We had it. You and I had a very candid conversation, and I was I was legitimately concerned that you were going to throw in the towel just because at, at that point you felt like there was no point of like a point of no return and i'm over here going it's our motherfucking narrative like <laughs> we have total control over this it's fine guys i'd like to just point out just for a moment that mallory's vocabulary when she says that we had a candid conversation what she means is we were yelling at each other <laughs> wow look at you you know, I got in trouble for doing that. What you really mean is I'm not allowed to do that. So you can't flip the script on me and use my tools. Well, I'm just saying I was getting my ass chewed because I had my head in my ass because my confidence was in the shitter. And I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for that. But you know it. my methodology. I give you a wide berth and I show you love and I show you support. And I, I give you the soft side. I give you the soft side. And But there comes a point. Where mama has to put her foot down and go, enough's enough. I've babied you. I've coddled you. I've supported you. And it's just getting worse. So let's get our big fucking girl panties on, pull up our bootstraps, and figure this shit out. Combat boots, yeah. Yeah, I'm just, come on, you do it for me. Yeah, probably. Actually, I have. But, you know, I, I think our time has been so limited with the new jobs and the stress that's come from the new gigs and I think it's just kind of infiltrated into other aspects of our lives. Uh, and not, I'm not actually pointing just at myself here. I think you too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I 100% again relate. I do see this as a little more of an outlet for me. Um, but my confidence, like, providing additional, like, this episode was primarily or orchestrated by you. And I felt more confident about recording it knowing that you had the reins on that because I'm a little hesitant. You did poo-poo my ideas. So, like, uh, I'm a little reserved about providing that kind of feedback and t- feedback until, like, there's a, 
We got this one under the belt, and then yeah, I'll well, have my so confidence this episode back. and the next one I are kind of laying me on the table for the room, right? So I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just saying that you know what what coming what what came this time that you guys are hearing, and next time I swear to God I'm literally going to record an episode with circus clowns or something after these two episodes because I feel like they're heavy, and heavy they scares are. me. Heavy scares me too. But I think it's valuable information because as a society, we have been conditioned to not call out the shit to sweep everything under the rug. You know, don't don't look under there. Everything's pretty. I can probably pull up in any subject. This is not just lifestyle. Any fucking podcast. And they're going to tell you how awesome they are or how great this is and what good researchers they are. It's all for the most part, unless you're listening to like murder podcasts, which there's a lot of those, too. Um, Are they instructional, it, like all the smarter podcasts? A lot of them. <laughs> a lot of them just say this is the right thing to do, and we we just don't always air all every side of it. And I think we have been pretty heavy, so we're going to incorporate some fun stuff in there too. Don't don't we're, get us wrong. I know we keep try. saying that, but <laughs> you know, I think something else that contributes to the shit is that we haven't been a Hito in fucking forever. You know what? That is an excellent point. Um, Hito's our happy place. It is, and it's I've become codependent. On that being my reset button and my center for, and my, the light at the end of my tunnel for when I'm having a shit month or a shit week or hell, I mean, it's fucking COVID, like a shit fucking year that that was my outlet. And we went all of 2021 and it was the first time in a very long time that we didn't touch home. And we're still trying to work out how we're going to get there in 2022. My first time since 2001. I know. And it's hard. It's it makes me question the kind of person I am that I rely on that as my reset button. Like I've put a lot of eggs in that basket um, to have the that opportunity to do that, and I haven't found a a surrogate for it or the ability to do it without going to keto. But it's been such a a crucial part of our social and lifestyle lives that when we took that out. It's actually been damaging for me, my self-esteem, my confidence, which we'll talk about that in another episode. Um, it, it's where I really stand out socially, right? I, I'm the, my most authentic self when I'm there, and I always feel like I'm filtered when we're on land here and in society. And then unless we're hanging out with lifestyle friends like the other weekend, I don't necessarily feel like I can be myself. So it's my opportunity just to... Yeah. Go fucking full out. Actually, that weekend between illnesses was it's, probably the first time that we felt, it kind of it felt is, like keto right here at home. When you said we felt like ourselves, like fucking preach a hundred percent. Yeah, that's definitely it. You know, speaking of keto, and I think one of the things that we've been missing, and, and I know there are a bunch of people that listen to this show that are friends of ours through the rascals. We fucking miss all of oh you my God. so much. Don't make me cry. Because I know if I talk, get into this too deep, I'm going to start crying because I miss those people so goddamn much. And Entertaining I'm the so, rascals is part of who we are and has been for a long time. Of course, absolutely. And the bonds and the friendships we've created. And I hate to say it, I was fucking envious. I loved that we got to hear how awesome the November and February trips yeah, were. They did a good job. They did a great job. But I'm sitting here going, God, I just wish I was there with you. I wish I was there. And I hate being that person because I want to celebrate them for having a good time. But I, I'm over here fucking kicking rocks because the more details they gave me about how much fun they had, just the, the more I missed it. Like, I remember one conversation where I hung up and I cried a little bit. And like, what a fucking bitch is that girl? Nah. Like, who does that? I think the all these things kind of contribute to the whole do we belong or we imposters exactly. kind of conversation that you have internally. Right. It exacerbated the issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And keep in mind, guys, there could be any number of reasons that you might feel like an imposter in your own lives. That's kind of what we're doing is yeah. we're talking about some things that have led us to these feelings mm -hmm. in hopes that maybe you can identify some normalcy in this, that it's it's not just you. It can happen to anybody. Right. I mean, and this can happen in, in lifestyle situations, right? And imposter syndrome is more prevalent than probably pe people will acknowledge. Very much so. Um, let's talk about some examples. Well, yeah. Yeah. What about um, where a couple's personal lives create a division in time where one of the two is doing most of the talking online or interacting with couples, so much so that one party feels maybe left out of the conversations or even the relationships altogether? 
<laughs> Great. So in other words, so one side feels left out completely, right? And they get maybe envious, mm-hmm. right? And we've talked about envy versus jealousy before. Envious yeah. means I want to too, mm-hmm. but they become jaded. Yeah, that's even worse because then they disconnect and the investment in the relationships basically just kind of cease. Yeah, they let the relationships go because yeah. they're afraid or they even believe that maybe moving too far forward is pointless or frustrating. Yeah, they're and I don't know what it is about human behavior, but when you feel like you're being left behind, like we don't give ourselves op- an opportunity to me- like reduce that mental chatter and and I don't know for lack of a better term, catch up. Mm-hmm. Give our give ourselves the opportunity to catch up if we feel left behind. What's stopping us from doing that? Because we always feel like, what, it's rude, it's too late, it's it's an impossibility. I, what is that about? Because I found myself doing that. Mm-hmm. We've actually had that happen with chats. And it's, yeah. you know, when maybe you're busy at a different time of the day than I am, so I pick up the slack, and now you're 50 chats behind because I'm an extrovert and run my mouth a lot. And all of a sudden, it, you kind of get this, what's the point? I'm out of the conversation now. <laughs> I'm like, hi, guys, I'm still here. I'm yeah. real. I promise. But that that feeling leads to an imposter syndrome. No one wants me here. This I'm not I'm, part of this. I'm not part of it. I'm not holding my end at the bargain. You know, I'm not as good as my spouse at this, or I'm not as good as the counterpart of the other couple. You start doing the comparisons. Right. Yeah. Well, how about another example? So when one side of the couple feels pushed, or maybe they're being forced to perform for the satisfaction of the other party. Maybe they're taking one for the team or maybe they're just not feeling it tonight. And their imposter syndrome kicks in when they finally come to terms with what they didn't want. And they don't know how to say it without hurting feelings. So, well, could, And now they might have created a precedent, right? Yeah. So now they have to be that imposter over and over again. Now it's maybe a rinse and repeat cycle that they've started. and Which they don't makes always, them really hate it. Well, then you're not always like conscious, like right. wit or conscientious. Uh, what's the right term? You don't acknowledge that it's happening when it's happening. It's always in hindsight that you ad- identify it. Oh. Conscious? I don't know. My vocabulary is in the shitter. I don't know. I'm two drinks in and recovering hey, from COVID. Dude, I only had, I haven't even finished my first one because I didn't want to start slurring at the end of the episode. Hey, you've done that before. It was pretty good. Yeah. I enjoyed that. You know, what? what I do think though is. People find themselves in that situation in a lot of different ways. It could be breaking or pushing boundaries, like, you know, full swap when you're not ready. Oh, what about bisexual? Oh, yeah. That's another one. I'm sorry, I interrupted. Barsexuals. Yeah. Like, there's there are situations I've seen and even maybe even participated in, you know, way back in the day where it's a behavior that maybe that person honestly isn't into, but it's an expectation. And mm-hmm. since they set that precedent, that they feel like they have to meet that standard every single time. So they're, yeah. Well, and I think a good example of that is when maybe women who are not bisexual feel like the girls have to kick play off. Right. And even though they're not bi, they have to play around. And then they have to get to the point where they are at their point of no return, where they have to tell the girl no or fend her off from taking it further, who had no idea that she wasn't bi. Yeah, or they feel compelled to because we've done it the last time or the time before that. And now I feel like I have to do it every time. Right. And then the last one, I think this is something I've actually put you through, uh, certainly more than you put me through it, because again, I'm a raging extrovert, but sacrificing personal time or rest to party or play when you really don't feel like it. I wouldn't say they're egregious, but yeah, if I'm being honest, yeah, so I have to raise the flag with you. I have to let you know when I absolutely need that or when... you. By all means, you go party it up. You continue to fill your battery. I have to go recharge mine. Right, because I'm actually energized by humans. You are actually drained by humans. Well, it's it's a, <laughs> such a weird balance. Yes and no. Like, in the moment, I am fucking charged to the T. And it's almost like day drinking and stopping late afternoon and knowing that you're going to bed early. Because if you don't continue on... You're just going to crash. And you know you're going to crash at the end of it anyway. It's just about prolonging that endurance, you know, or tenacity or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Well, and I guess kind of not necessarily, uh, you know, last, because there's a lot of ways that this can happen, a lot of ways that we can be left feeling like imposters or like we're doing it wrong. And because imposter can be a lot of things, right? It's Mm -hmm. not just faking it, like, you know, the traditional definition of an imposter. Uh, but imposter, I know I can make words, but you know, when we had everybody here, 
a few weekends ago, uh, I kind of came away from it feeling like, did we do something wrong? I mean, did people want something and I missed it? I, I, am I a bad swinger for not picking up on signals? Did somebody, well, I mean, there was one signal that I couldn't miss, Mm -hmm. but I was trying not to send the wrong signal at the time uh, to somebody, Mm -hmm. uh, which, which is, you know, nobody that I think even listens to the show, but I think, it was a challenge for me because we didn't play when everybody was here, but partially, I mean, I'm starting to feel sicker as the weekend went on. <laughs> yeah. It was a weird time. Like I, I honestly think if we had tried to tee it up, the timing was just off because we went from like, I had the really weird period, right? The one that oh, came yeah, in that between. Did hit in a weird time. I think that was work and do stress, honestly. Yeah. And so my hormones are just all over the place. I had my blood drawn this week. That shit checked. Um, and then the sickness started to kick in like late in the last week. And so I, I don't, I think the timing was off, but I get where your head is because I also left going, did I miss anything? Did anyone, if I wanted, did I want anyone to feel a certain way and did I give them the wrong impression? Right. Because you know how much I love and, and adore those people. And I felt like I gave off these like superhuman platonic vibes, which that's not me. No, because we're not platonic with with a no, number of these people. But in hindsight, I was like, "What? What was that about?" Yeah. Well, and then f- from my side, right? Once again, did I send the wrong signals by not asking for the business or not at least being a little more sexually playful? Right. Do, do people think I'm not into them because I don't? You know, I think <laughs> it's probably a question we should ask the the respective parties versus maybe debating it do you on think podcast. I don't, do you think I don't like you? <laughs> but I'd be interested in what their perspective would be. You know, I think hindsight's twenty twenty, and this is very much, you know, off the cuff for me, but I think that's probably the best place to start versus a debate here, if I'm being brutally honest. So shut the fuck up on the podcast and go talk to the people. I, I don't know that you necessarily have to shut the fuck up. The cat's out of the bag, but I do believe that that's the proper next step. Well, I don't think there was anybody here that doesn't know that we love them, right? That we, I, I mean, they wouldn't, we wouldn't have invited them know. all to our house to stay the weekend and hang out if we weren't, you know, at least down to be their friend. But I think that this goes deeper than that. Yeah. It's like, did we want more? Because I don't think we said we did or we didn't. Well, and I, th- I think it goes back to that peer conversation too, because I'm not going to lie, like I feel like there's times where that mental chatter gets to me and I'm wondering if my, my friends and my peers are qualifying what kind of swinger the value of me as a swinger actually is. And that's unnerving. And I don't even know that they're actually doing that. That's just something I've decided in my head. That's just the monster under your bed. Uh huh. Absolutely. That's not your womanizer, by the way. No, no. But so let's kind of give you guys a cap on this thing, right? It can happen to anybody. But the truth will set you free. How do we get past this? Yeah, what's the plan? How do we <laughs> kick? Plan? How do we kick this thing? And if you're feeling it yourself, what can you do to break free from your own imposter syndrome? All right, you go first. Okay, well, let's start with whatever you are, whoever you are. Um, it's fucking okay. However you are, there's no definition of a swinger or any permutation that of that is not okay. And I understand very, very clear. This is easier fucking said than done. But this is something you have to maybe use as a mantra. I mean, I, I know I have to when I'm in these, like, you know, low points and I'm starting to question and give in to that chatter. And at the end of the day, who actually gives a fuck if the label does or doesn't apply? Does that is that going to change my behavior if someone unlabels, mislabels me? What does that change about me and how I'm going to proceed? And for me personally, at this point, I have to say fucking nothing. (laughs) That goes back to something that we tell our kids all the time. What other people think of you is none of your business. Thank you. Right? Right. Yeah. You know, and I think that just goes back to me wanting to be accepted and affirmed by my peers. I think that's a core need that I have. Yeah. Well, I mean, who gives a flying fuck if the label applies to you or doesn't? You matter. Period. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. End of conversation. You matter, and whatever yeah. you are is fine. I think there's another step though that comes before that. Well, go ahead. I think you have to identify what you're feeling. You have to yeah. be honest about it. Are you sad? Are you lonely? Envious? Jealous? Bored? Do you feel left out? Horny. 
Do you poop out at parties? <laughs> Are you unpopular? If anyone gets that reference, I will show you my tits. <laughs> Every episode, she finds a way to show you guys them titties, guys. I don't know how it happens. Yeah, I, I think you're right, though. These are all ultimately feelings of inadequacy, and that's what the imposter syndrome is all about, mm -hmm. is am I good enough? Yeah, that feeling of inadequacy. Inadequ all right, well, we all know what it is. Okay, cool. cool. <laughs> it's something you're doing, not doing, saying, not saying, and it's creating this emotion, this emotion that you can't necessarily put your finger on that makes you feel like maybe you're not what you purport yourself to be. Is it something somebody else is saying or doing that's making you feel this way? It's kind of important because your actions will either be proactive or reactive yeah. as a result of whether it's something you think someone is saying or feeling mm -hmm. or something they are saying or 100%, feeling. 100%. I'm going to call you out for being my Jiminy Cricket because sometimes I need you. And I, and I do this for you as well, but I'll, I'll call you out. You have to tell me when it's me or outside influence sometimes because there are are moments where I can't tell the difference. I've decided it's an outside influence, but I'm in my bubble. Reminds me of an early work conversation we had when you joined this company. Yeah. I told you not all bullets are meant for you. Yes. Just because it's war, just because they're flying, doesn't mean it's yours. Yeah. This is very true. And I, I, I'm so appreciative of that. It may be a struggle for me to hear it at the time, but I'm appreciative that you give me the opportunity to level set in those moments. And I'm sorry it has to be you because I don't always take that criticism well. no sometimes you go fuck <laughs> you and run out of my office i but. know that's exactly what's happening <laughs> oh, i saw it well and this is going to be ad nauseum another fucking swinger podcast telling you to communicate with your partner say what this is a new revelation surely you jest <laughs> and don't call me Shirley. Oh, airplane reference. I got you. I'm old. I can make those references. Yeah, man. Check out my glasses. English professor right here, bitches. <laughs> uh, so I think it's important to tell each other when you're just not okay. And I do this sometimes, even when I don't know exactly what is happening. But I just go, not okay. Definitely not okay. Not okay over here. And I know. Wearing a life vest. You bless your heart. You're like, ooh, shit. This could either be very strange or very, very very long nights <laughs> like because I, I may not know what it means but i just know i'm not okay yeah yeah i think one of the hardest things to do when somebody starts waving their hands is leave the blame on the floor and one of the Ooh, easiest what do you mean by that leave the blame on the floor well so the easiest thing to do when you get upset is say something that starts with the word you ownership and accountability there yeah and I so getcha. that you go you did this and you did that and you want me to and you make me feel and every time you start a sentence with the word you it is it, i'm sorry you're firing you're firing across the field at that point and the other person's gonna start ducking and running for cover or start firing back <laughs> good thing i have the aim of a stormtrooper you really do <laughs> it's fucking awesome by the way i just love watching you just fire away and hit the wall but now it is true though that when you start just hurling shit from your heart that's driven by fear it almost always starts with the word you yeah and it never really I, I turns have to into the conversation about i feel like or when this happens, it makes me feel this way, and I don't want to. You think subconsciously we're always going to be resistant to it because it presents vulnerability, that we have to be accountable for all those emotions? I think being honest and with being yourself exposed. requires vulnerability, and vulnerability is scary when you're already scared. Yeah. Now, the last thing you want when you're already scared is to be more scared, yeah. right? It's like, hmm, I want, we should put a, ho like a, a, a haunted house at the bottom of this roller coaster and see what happens. Yeah, no thanks. You know, it's, yeah, and we're full of clowns. Mm, I'm out. <laughs> right? I think you have to be honest with yourself and each other and stating what you do and you don't want from your lifestyle journey. And that changes with the wind, by the way. It's right. not set in stone because you want it this weekend and not next weekend. I think that's hard for people to wrap their head around. It's hard for us to wrap our head around sometimes. Yeah, I think we should take our own advice on this one. Yeah, we might need to. Just know that any fraction doesn't make you more or less of a swinger or a lifestyler or ethically non-monogamous or consensually non-monogamous or a kinkster or a poly or whatever the fuck it is you want. You can be an eggplant for all I care. 
lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, you are what you are and you are what you want to be, even if you're a little itty bitty bit of it and you're just trying to find your way. It's okay. Yeah, and fuck the haters. Fuck them. Well, fuck them if you want to fuck them. Haterade. All right. I think that sums up the imposter syndrome, don't you? I think it does too. Do you think we should go ahead and do some whiskey of the month here in a minute? I think we should. Yeah. It's been a it's been a while. Well, we owe them this one. <laughs> and if we do this, this one now one. and we're on time with the next episode, we will get March out before the end of March. <gasps> Say what? Say what? Yeah, that'll be awesome. All right. Well, we're not going to make Mallory tell you guys how to find us again. We'll let her do it at the end of the next segment. Oh, thank God, because, yes. And it's not like you guys, I mean, come on, there's only four of you that hung with us after this fucking break anyway. But we'll be back in a hot second with February's Whiskey of the Month. <laughs> you guys have been listening to Catherine Swinger. Oh, back one more time to finish this episode off with Whiskey of the Month. This yes. is still Casual Swinger, and this is Mickey. Yes, and this is Mallory. Guess who's back? Back again. This is the fucking m and I guess so. Or what? Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is the Mallory Mathers episode, folks. <laughs> oh, that was a good one. Yeah, right. <laughs> so we're going to do Whiskey of the Month. Whiskey of the Month is brought to you by fucking us, because we don't have sponsors. No, we don't, but I love this one. I'm so excited. Well... Now, before we get into that, of course, this little line from our friend Starry and Whiskey of the Month. All right, off we go. Whiskey of the Month for February, better late than never, is, drum roll, please. Is that a drum roll? (laughs) No. It was a really bad drum roll. (laughs) Okay, sorry. Bib and Tucker. (gasps) Yay, I'm so excited. So this is one of my go-to bourbons, personally, and it is a, a bourbon. It is. It's a six-year bourbon. Which I'm impressed. I find this bourbon to be rather smooth. It's definitely a staple. It's probably in my top five most frequented bourbons, especially when we're out and about drinking. Yeah, if you see it, you get it. And that's something I've always noted about it. I will tell you guys, this is one of those bourbons that Mallory and I disagree on. I was going to say, this is, I and I can see why it's polarizing. You're either going to love it or hate it. So if you love it, you're welcome. If you hate it, talk to Mickey. Um, <laughs> yeah. I was gonna, this is proof, <laughs> by the way, to... that we equally contribute to this show. Because well, this no, one is not one of mine. Because you guys can hate it together. No, you, right. I don't know that you hate it. It's just not one of your favorites. And you don't tend to gravitate towards these younger bourbons. Yeah, it's um, true. So this one was born in Tennessee and aged for six years. Um, Bib and Tucker is a small batch bur- bourbon that is marketed for its discerning whiskey consumers. So meaning they, they acknowledge it's a smaller market yeah, for this, they this flavor profile. At the price point, too. Yes. So the small batch bourbon has received multiple accolades, including uh, 90 points from wine and 96 points from the tasting panel. Um, so a small batch whiskey is comprised, comprised, compromised, yeah, comprised. Okay. Uh, of a selected number of barrels that are mixed together to create a desired taste. So this could range um, really differently depending on the kind of whiskey you're talking about. Um, so. They can be, what, 10 to 50 different barrels? That's the general standard for it. And the reason we're talking about that, guys, is that a lot of people confuse small batch and single barrel. That's true. And single barrel means it was poured from a single barrel. Small batch means it's a blend of a number of barrels. Excellent. So a blended bourbon, if you will. But blended with others kind of like it. It's not a blend with like a black currant like Von Payne was in the earlier part of this episode. Correct. Similar recipes. Exactly. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, the aging and the finishing is where it really develops its flavor anyway. That's right. So, Yeah, well, it's like Ingrid said in our last episode, let the wood do the work. So I'm going to just let you know, it's my favorite. Next to Willits, it's my favorite bottle. Oh, it's the coolest bottle it's, in the business next to Willett. It think. is. It's definitely inspired by by a throwback to like the 1800 saloon era. Like you look at this bottle and go, I have to uncork it with my mouth. Right, you do like it, like you just satisf- rip it off like you're in a saloon, yes, like and ex- dr- and swilling it, you spit know, it out, yeah. take it right from the bottle. Like it, it's a beautiful, very well done bottle as far as nostalgia. Well, it's funny goes. that you mentioned that because the words "bib" and "tucker" are actually a throwback to an 1800s phrase. Get the fuck out! I didn't know that. They are. It's actually the phrase "bib and tucker" was used to describe one's finest attire. Ooh! In the 1800s, so when you went out on, for a night on the town, you put on your bib and tucker. 
Oh, get out. I'm totally using that forevermore. Yeah. So that's like something cool about that whiskey. Yeah. So it kind of looks like um, the way they designed this to, to nod to that area, it looks like a, an enlarged flax. Right, it but does. it's it's a dark brown bottle with embossed uh, words on it, so it almost looks like it came from like an apothecary or like uh, the snake oil salesman back in the day on the the wagons, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it, it's kind of a throwback to the refinement of that era, right? I mean, it's just kind of the yes, the embossed would... like stand out letters on the bottle because there's no label on the bottle. Yeah. There's nothing. There's one sticker. That's it, oh, and it's over the top. Yes. I mean, there's really nothing to it, and there's a little like, sh- like hand strung label kind of tag yeah, and hanging even off the, of it. The, even the cork looks hand drilled or pressed. Right. So I, I think that it it's really makes it feel appropriate for a special occasion, a dinner party, hanging out with yeah, friends. Yeah, it's it's ornate. I would definitely describe it as a, ornate. Sure. Now this bottle retails for forty eight ninety nine at Total Wine everywhere in the country for the six year. If you go upwards from there to the ten year or higher. You, or the clear whiskey, for example, you're going to pay a little more for it. But the forty eight ninety nine price point does qualify it for whiskey of the month. Yes, this is true. And again, one of my top fives. Um, we'll get into the tasting notes um, in a minute. But on your research, um, you said it was founded in 2013. And I didn't realize it was that young as far as a brand goes. Yeah, it was fairly new on the scene, right? I mean, and it was founded by a guy that's famous for wine. <laughs> it's... This is another one we found because we'll talk about the 19 crimes, burning chair, and, and all that stuff at a later date. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is another really great bourbon that was founded by winemakers. And I find that fascinating that there's this transition and knowledge base that goes along with it. So this guy's name was August Sebastiani. Yep. Right? And um, his company, 35 Maple Street, initially launched Bibb & Tucker as an eight-year bourbon from an undisclosed Tennessee distillery. But by the time the brand started shipping, it was being bottled as an OEM in Crestwood, Kentucky. Yeah, Which I was. found interesting. Yeah, well, and, you know, one of the biggest delays was starting the brand was the bottle. Yeah. They had such a vision for what this bottle was going to look like and feel like that it was actually arguably more important than what was in it. You know, and I, you have to have an appreciation for their go-to-market strategy and their investment in the visual aid that comes along with it because, let's face it, so a good portion of drinking is partly mental. The look and the feel, the taste and the application is totally part of the experience, but let, let's all be honest, we're suckers for cool bottles. Well, it, I think it goes back to if you want to like something, there's a better chance you will. Yeah. Right. And that can go for a lot of things in life. If I want to be pissed off and I don't want to like something, it's going to be a lot harder for me to like it. I mean, I did not want to like Von Payne. Yeah, that's true. When I got it, I, I looked at the bottle, I, I looked at everything they were trying to do, and I went, Ugh, I'm so pissed off that somebody's targeting the lifestyle. And then it was amazing. And this is another one where, I mean, if you want to like it, you're probably going to. And Bib and Tucker will get into the tasting notes here in a second, but that 18 month delay with that unique bottle. I mean, that it's an amber customized bottle that created so many issues for these guys and really kind of gave that allure back. And that was before those really unique flavors jumped out at you the first time you had Bibbit. Oh, my gosh, I loved it. What I noticed first is a lot lighter in color than the bourbons or, or whiskeys. Actually, it's probably in line with bourbons, but it is on the lighter side. It's like a light copper gold, mm-hmm. right, when you pour it. And if you're drinking rye, you expect a deeper, rich, more caramel, you know, uh, color to it. Um, on the nose, like you can get a little chocolate. You definitely get oak, um, maybe a little bit of vanilla on it, but the flavor is what got me. Um, it's definitely going to be a little warmer. And I say that because you get ginger and cinnamon in there. Um, a little bit of caramel, obviously. Um, and it's finished. It's, it's warm. It lingers for a bit and it's a little hot, but it's hot on the back. Hot. It's hot on the backside. So. Yeah, hot in the backside can mean a lot of things if you're a swinger, but for whiskey, it just means it burns a little bit going down. It does. You know, this is not a bourbon I necessarily drink neat. I do drink it over, you know, a large ice cube and let it melt a little bit so it has a natural uh, cool water back to it. Yeah, I I actually see this as being a complimentary whiskey for something like a Manhattan. I think, yeah, no, I can see that in a Manhattan when you add the sweet and the bitters to it and help balance that out a little bit. Yeah, balance out that hot Mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. But these guys, by the way, uh, they're It'd not. actually be ma- good in a French ni- 95. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Now you're yeah. talking Ingrid's language. Yeah. Right. But uh, these guys are no longer are no longer owned 
by Maple Street, by the way. They're owned by Deutsch Spirits. And Bib and Tucker is part of a brand family that now includes stalwarts such as Masterson's and Redemption Whiskeys. I was going to say, Deutsch has really scooped up some really good brands. Yeah, those are slick bastards. They yeah, knew they what they are. were doing. They picked up a couple of really good ones, but eh, they know what they're doing. But we're going to put a link to Total Wine in the show notes so you guys can check out Bib and Tucker for yourself. But this is a nationally available brand. You should be able to get it just about anywhere you love whiskey. And remember... For the forty eight ninety nine price point, you should be able to find that just about anywhere and qualify for Whiskey of the Month. But if uh, you want to go higher end, by all means, look at their 10-year, look up the, yeah. up the realm a little bit. These are all blended whiskeys, small batch whiskeys. They're OEMs, so this is all about the finish. And if you like it, you'll love it. And if you don't, blame Mallory. No, you'll talk to Mickey. <laughs> oh, it's all my fault now. <laughs> well, no, so you guys can hate it together. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but hey, this will be the first month we've ever done two Whiskey of the Months because this was February's Whiskey of the Month. And again, we'll put that in the show notes so you guys know where to find it, where to buy it. If you love it, if you hate it, it's all good. But Mallory, we got to yes. get the fuck out of here. It's been an hour and 11 hey, minutes. you know what? We fucking missed you guys. Thanks for accepting us back into the community and not judging us for <laughs> They haven't accepted us yet. <laughs> we might get it's, five listens on this episode. It's the assumptive close, sir. All right. Presumptuous right. bitch. Much. Yes, I is. All well, right. since you're being presumptuous, tell us where to find us. We is Casual Swinger everywhere. You can find us at casualswinger.com or shoot us a note at podcast at casualswinger.com. We are on social media, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Sexy Twitter. Um, and you can also find us on the dating sites. It's Double Date Nation, SCC, SLS, and Cassidy. All right, guys, coming up in no time at all. We've got another episode coming your way. And don't forget, 30 days of lingerie is coming your way. 30 different days. I'm going to post Mallory's sweet ass on Twitter. I can't wait to snatch that lingerie. I'm so excited. It's going to be hotter than Bib and Tucker. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for hanging with us, guys. We'll be back in just a couple of weeks. Promise we won't be late with the next one. You've been listening to Casual Swinger. Casual Swinger.